Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Torkum Talk. Uh, we have this week Abe Shihadi, who is the founder of Blackstrap, which is those awesome things that everybody wears on their masks when they go skiing. A company built right here in Bend, Oregon, from the ground up. Um, in this podcast, you start to learn of how he took it from in his house, personally sewing the first Blackstrap, and then also having a huge national, international distribution. Uh, being the best in class made here in the United States and we just get into depth on like what makes him tick uh, What we go really in depth on culture um, the build out he has really interesting ways on how he lets his team kind of do whatever they want uh, For an hour every week really really fascinating that I think we could all learn a lot from um, So please enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Abe and myself So, Abe, good to see you. Yeah, Thanks hey, for being yeah, on the hey, show. Nice um, and, uh, you know, interesting thing is Blackstrap. But, you know, first, a word from our sponsor. As it comes down. All right. This is uh, Habit Hot Sauce. And uh, it is a local, organic... Uh, pepper company that makes <laughs> non-GMO, uh, non-vinegar raw peppers. <laughs> if you want local free range peppers, you want Habit hot sauce. Okay, so that was a word from our sponsor. And, um, <laughs> all right, so anyway, getting into uh, UA and all the stuff that, you know, people uh, may or may not have known uh, what you basically have grown, as I've been saying in the bio before we came on here, but quite impressive going from um, in your house, in your garage, is that what you want to yeah, call it? Yeah, my, you made your my first one, one bedroom. In your yep. one bedroom. Okay, so one bedroom you had. Let's first talk, talk about um, the opportunity that you saw. Uh, opportunity. I mean, essentially it was just formulating a better mousetrap, right? Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, I was snowboarding in a time where face masks weren't yet a thing, right? And I noticed that the cool trend was everybody was wearing a bandana. And we all know what happens with a couple of lift rides with a man bandana, right? I've never you, even tried it. I don't oh, imagine man, it'd be it's, awful. Oh, man. It's, it's, yeah. yeah, it's terrible. So At least you look cool. Especially when you're in here in the Northwest, right, where yeah. the temperature fluctuating. I mean, it's... What year is this? Uh, this is 2005. Okay. And uh, essentially, you look cool on your first run. And then by the time you get to your second and third run, you got a frozen triangle on your face. It was terrible. Right. And, uh, you know, I just graduated college and, um, you know, I moved to beautiful Bend, Oregon mm -hmm. and I took my first lift ride at Mount Bachelor. And for the first time in my snowboarding history, I experienced every weather pattern you could imagine on one lift ride. It was crazy. That's what happens here. Oh man. It was, yeah. it was intense, you know? And so, you know, naturally I went down to the shop and bought a face mask and it was a cotton bandana and it was terrible and froze to my <laughs> face and then bought another one and it was also terrible. And. You know, the light bulb went off at that moment. I was like, you know, I think I can do this better. You know, so. was was the light bulb that went off? Was it a material wise design? Essentially, at first, it was more just I, material based, right? I mm -hmm. could make something out of a better material that would be a little more functional. You mm -hmm. know, the idea is where I'm wearing this really expensive jacket. Why don't I have something really expensive that's quality that can go on my face as well? Yeah. Um, and then the research happened, right? And you know, a year of understanding fabrics and patterns and all these things kind of took forth after that, you know, that first day at Mount Bachelor there. Okay. All right. So you're making, so this was where the light bulb went off and um, you go and you start to sew them. What, can we, can we walk through that yeah. really quick? Because that's something that a lot of people don't do. You know, there's a big difference on people. You know what would be a good idea? I could totally see myself sitting with a friend going up Mount Bachelor. Like, you know what would be a good idea if you made a better, like, thing to go on your right. face, like wearing a frozen bandana? Right. That was probably said for 50 years on Mount Bachelor. So what, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, I mean, essentially what happened was, you know, I, everything I did is just by process of thinking that's the way you do things, right? So after... So it's just normal to you. Yeah, just after it's researching... It's normal to me too, yeah. but we, we still have to think this out because it can be normal to other people. Yeah, I, I didn't know any better, right? It's Google was my friend at that time, right? It was <laughs> like, how do I sew a face mask, right? Yeah. And believe me, I was not a great sewer. 
Um, so essentially I got the idea for the fabric. You know, I found some fabrics at the time that were technical. Um, and again, still researching on how to develop my own fabrics mm -hmm. and, you know, bought a sewing machine and sewed up a couple myself. Do you ever do any sewing before that? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> That's amazing to me. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay. So here's somebody who think, yeah, but I can't really sew. But you're like, okay, then learn how to like for, um, like this habit startup I'm doing, I'm not a good chef. I'm not. Right. I just, I was like, you know, it'd be fun if we made like a good fermented hot sauce. And now it's have, has some legs and it's running, but don't ask me to cook you dinner. Right. It's not going to, I mean, I could do it. It's just going to be bad. I mean, what do they say? What's that famous saying that they say like the best ideas and the best products come from like being born of necessity. Right. Mm -hmm. So either you figure it out or you get somebody to do it for you kind of thing. You know, it, you know, at that time, YouTube was kind of taken off, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so you, you best believe I watched hours of YouTube videos <laughs> on how, how to just how to sew a product. Yeah. You know, I had no idea what terminologies meant. I didn't know what sewing machine to buy, but I knew I'd figure it out. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, I figured it out. I, you know, I sewed some face masks, which, you know, I would say were probably a B minus work mm -hmm. at best. They were, they, they were okay. Okay. Um, you know, I drove them up. But they're to, better than a bandana. Oh, they were much better than a bandana. I mean, that mm -hmm. was my idea from the beginning was, you know, a technical fabric, but still have that fashion behind it that you can get with a bandana, you know, that cool factor. So mm -hmm. you can look good. Um, I drove up to Mount Bachelor and, uh, Terry Blaylock at the time, uh, which is still the buyer there today, which is super cool. Um, took a flyer on me and just said, well, you know, you're local. You know, I don't really need more of these same things, but since you're local, I'll give you a shot. So let's talk about that really quick. Um, okay, so a person, you, but mm -hmm. like anybody who's like, well, okay, well, well, now I have this thing. What do I do with this thing? How do I sell this thing? Which I run into those problem, these problems with uh, wannabe entrepreneurs, which nothing against them. They can. A lot of times they just need some guidance. So here's right. some guidance. Not that this is right or wrong, but did you know Terry before even driving up to Mount Bachelor? No. How'd so you the, set up that appointment? No. So the funny, the funny story was, is you know, as I said, Google was my friend at that time, right? Yeah. So I was, I was googling everything, right? Like how to, how to sell something, right? Who do you talk to? You know, like I didn't know a buyer was called a buyer at the time, right? I just mm -hmm. figured you talk to a manager at the store. Um, so after, you know, I got my confidence about me and that kind of stuff, I, you know, I just drove up to the shop and uh, talked to the first lady I saw in the front and said, hey, um, do you guys have a buyer here? Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they they did look at me a little bewildered, like they've never had a person walk in here before and ask them that question, you know. And yeah. uh, they told me, oh, yeah, it's that guy right back there, you know. And I and I told you, I never forget it. You know, I remember, um, you know, just m my nerves taking over me and just my, you know, my whole heart sinking in my stomach. Cause I looked back down this long, narrow path in Mount Bachelor and he was back in this little office and we were about to have a meeting two feet from each other. Right. I didn't, I didn't even get to break the ice in front of a lot of people. And, uh, it was the longest, you know, hundred feet, you know, I'd ever walked. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I walked back there and, um, he asked me, he was a really nice guy, you know, just asked me what I was, you know, showing or selling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I pretty much, I remember just word vomiting every, all my ideas out of him and he took a flyer on me, which was super cool. Okay. So, um, basically you knew who to ask for, yep. but one thing I find fascinating is it's like, you didn't go needing an appointment. Correct. And I, you know, I didn't know any better, right? I didn't know that I was think the that's proper. A, I think that's an advantage, though. I, absolutely. I agree yeah. with you, right? I think he looked at me. Because if you were to call yeah. him on the phone and be like, yeah, you know, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, and maybe he sets appointment for you when he knows he's not going to be there. Yeah. One thing I, I think I learned not from. Not saying that Terry would do that. but Yeah, I know. But I learned from a young childhood, too, that, you know, I learned this from my dad, is you always have better interactions face to face. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing I did take to this meeting is I knew if I called him, I'd probably never get a call back. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing I did learn and bring, you know, you know, as ammunition to that meeting, I guess, was that I was going to meet this person face to face and I was going to give him everything I got and hopefully he buys into what I was selling. Right. Right. And uh, I'll never forget it too. Cause he asked me, you know, he's asking me things, all the terminology that they use in the industry, like, Oh, what kind of terms do you give? And mm -hmm. you know, how do you ship the product? And I remember, you know, just taking mental notes of what he was asking me so I could go back home and Google, mm -hmm. you know, what, what this meant and what this meant. And, uh, you know, the rest was history. So, so then that, um, but what is the rest being history? So when, okay, you have that order and, uh, how many buy from you? Uh, 50 pieces. Okay. So 50. And so you didn't, did you have 50 to sell? No. So I had, f I made 51 actually. Okay. And the one was the prototype uh -huh. and I was going in there hoping to sell 10. 
right? Because, you know, my perception of the way this worked was, you know, there was never more than 10 to 20 units of this category on mm -hmm. any one peg. So I thought, oh, I could get one peg in this store. So I made 50 thinking I would go to five stores, sure. you know? And uh, he bought all of them. He bought all of them right out of the gate, you know. And I remember, you know, not saying a word, just being like, "Oh wow, that that, that was went, easy." Yeah, that was easy. It went really well. <laughs> um, Were you kind of uh, what about when it comes to market share in town? Did that did you think about that, or were you just stoked to have the sale? Yeah, I, I was just pretty excited to have the sale at that time. Yeah. I mean, I was a transplant to Bend, mm -hmm. and uh, I moved here for the community, and I knew the community would back us a little bit, mm -hmm. um, but I knew it wouldn't be easy, right? Because we are in a outdoor mecca and everybody uses the products here so i knew if i made something it had to be something really good still it couldn't just be i'm from bend right um and so right you know the first week after that it was it was more or less just the sale was the most important thing to me it's like oh wow they actually sold okay um the the next step to that conversation is when he called me the next day and he wanted 50 more that's where the dilemma happened. the very next day very next day yep Okay. Um, so then you just YouTube how to sew faster. Uh, yeah. So essentially what happened is uh, I stayed up for pretty much 24 hours straight. Uh -huh. And I sewed those 50 tubes to make sure he got them. And luckily we were kind of in the tail end of the season. We were in February um, when it happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Mount Bachelor was kind of getting their last few storms. And, you know, because I thought if this was, if we were going to get 50 every day, I don't know how I could live. Right. <laughs> um, but I got them those extra 50 tubes and, you know, and those sold as well and that this went on for about 10 days straight um, so you're oh making yeah. 50 tubes oh a day. yeah i was eating peanut butter sandwiches and drinking gallons of coffee just to stay awake but i was making sure he was getting his product that's all that mattered to me at the time so wow okay so then how did you relieve yourself so uh once the season kind of dialed down a little bit um you know i uh started researching okay there's got to be some factories that can do small mm -hmm. production runs and, uh, you know, Google is, you know, my friend and, uh, turns out that both LA and New York at the time are hubs for, um, small batch sewing, mm -hmm. right? So, you, you know, any you know, orders under 300 units, that kind of thing. So I just started picking up the phone and calling factories. Um, and so how did those conversations go? So I think if I remember right, I make sure they take you seriously, right? Yeah. I mean, I always opened up, you know, Hey, my name is Abe. Um, mm -hmm. I have this idea and I have this company. And at the time we were using stretch fabrics. It, uh, is not something that's easy to sew. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't, uh, active wear and that kind of thing wasn't a thing yet. Okay. And so, especially in LA and so, um, to sew our products wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I remember I called 42 factories and the 43 third said yes yeah so i called the first 42 they all said no and i gave it one more shot to see if i could get it done and the last guy said yes what did what was the difference i think the first 20 i learned uh what they said no to right away what and so uh just i started with oh i need to sew like 500 so i, I led with how many units i wanted to sell um, so why, essentially, why, why would that turn them off? Not enough or yeah, not enough quantity, not enough for them to make money. You know, okay. uh, at the time I didn't know, you know, I thought you could just send a rectangle in to be sewed and somebody could sew it. But I started to learn after having conversations and taking notes and getting information from these factories one by one, they would all give me a little more information is the process in which it takes to sew a product, you know, mm -hmm. building patterns and, and having markers and digital things and all kinds of things to make this product repeatable. And it. so it's repeatable the same way. And so basically when I got to the end of, you know, having those conversations, I was almost as well versed as some of these factory guys. So I was able to like get on their playing field and kind of communicate in the way that they needed to communicate. And, you know, that last guy, I remember, uh, it turned out he was, uh, when I called him, he actually threw another friend knew my dad. Oh, okay. And I pulled that string pretty hard. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, it turned out that he took a flyer on me as well, right? He said, you know, we'll give it a shot and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sewed some products for me. So now you have products that are being made. You have it proved that people will buy them at least locally here. Um, now, how are you making sure that the manufacturer that you just recruited is going to be have, to have customers that want them? Right. And so... Uh, first two years, so call it about 2009 to 2011, um, you know, again, learning the process, I just went out and by myself and sold products. So at the time there was a campus, uh, campus rail jam tour going mm -hmm. on and pretty much everywhere they went, I went and had a little booth and I was selling them direct to consumers a lot. And 
I would, you know, bend, uh, I had uh, gotten Mount Bachelor. My next store that I went into uh, was Sure Shaw's okay. at the time. And they also took a flyer on me. And so I knew to make this uh, viable, not only- When you say take a flyer, what do you mean? Take a, basically just take a gamble, right? Okay. It's willing to take a chance, right? It's either going to succeed or it's not. Right. Um, you know, and most of yeah, the time- Yeah, because they're they're buying it from you and then they have to sell them. <laughs> totally, yeah. yeah. So and you know, and I didn't know I was I knew one thing I wasn't gonna do and I wasn't gonna do consignment, right? So I wasn't gonna put the product in there. Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it wasn't the work factor, is uh I noticed going into a few shops, I saw some consignment things, and I noticed that when the shops weren't invested in that product, they sold that product last. Mm. Right. It's when they bought other products, those are the products that they made sure were off their floor first. What a concept. Yeah. So it I makes kind of, a lot of sense. Yeah. So I kind of <laughs> learned right at the beginning, you know, yeah. I was like, okay, consignment is not the right way to go with this mm. is, you know, and, uh, it just seems more appealing because it'd be like, Oh, you do it on consignment and then you'll buy more and then totally. like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Yeah, but, it's, it's great idea for the stores, right? Mm. It really takes the risk away for them. But in reality, if they have no skin in the game, right, they're not, they're not going to try to sell your no, brand. They're not going to train it or anything like that. Uh, like I just had a, I, I just dealt with that this morning. Oh, wow. So um, uh, we just launched Habit, and um, uh, congrats on that! By oh, the way, yeah. the hot Th sauce is amazing. Thank you, thank you. So we just launched it, and um, Zydeco is one of our first restaurant partners. And so um, I came to him with, he ordered, I came to him with his order, and he has these sixty bottles, and I'm just like. All right, here you go, and he and he cuts me a check right away. Thank God, not a net fifteen, net thirty, which was really nice of him. Right. Um, and he's like, "This is great." He's all excited. He's like, "He couldn't wait for it to happen." But because he cut that check, I think this has a lot to do with it. And it wasn't consignment thing. He calls me two hours later. I'm back here in Mazama. I'm working away, getting in the middle of and Steve's calling me, and I'm like, "What's up? Did one of them blow up because they ferment?" <laughs> right. It hasn't happened yet. But, <laughs> Uh, it's gonna, it's going to happen because it's a live product. That's one of the beautiful things about it. But anyway, he's like, okay, I just trained my staff on it, and they love it so much that we're gonna pair it with all of the jambalaya, which is our main seller. And when they eat the jambalaya, we're gonna come out with the bottle habit from the pour even more on. That's and I was cool. just like, holy shit! <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> what I do now, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just like, that's great. He's just like, he's like, so I mean, can we get it work out like another price? Because this stuff's gonna go fast. I was like, well, how about you buy it from the gallon? And he's just like, I never thought about it like that. Then I could fill them up myself. And I'm like, uh huh. Save a bunch of money. Right. I'll fill them. Save on glass. But um, to your point, he already paid for them. So, so he tried them, right? Yeah, not, they, didn't, yeah. they didn't end up in a fridge in the back corner or exactly. something, Exactly. Right? He already paid them. He already paid for them. And, um, you know, shelf life is another thing. It's only three months on the product. So it's just like, well. So now he's got to sell them, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if I would have done that on consignment, which I can do. I mean, I can't go up to him. So goes, how about you pay me half of, you know, whatever right. comes in? Then I'll be like, yeah, you know, there's a product there. Uh, yeah, I mean, expires. having skin of the game is the way to go, right? And then, you I know, now. I, I didn't know I would agree right. so much until today. I mean, now, like, what I've noticed is all the companies that support supported, you know, me in the beginning, right? That put skin in the game. They, they all now feel that they contributed to the success. To your success. Yeah. You know, and I've noticed like, you know, other brands where they do the consignment thing, they it's don't like get that. Same, yeah. They don't have that same attachment. You know, we have mm -hmm. brands, we have shops now that have been with us since the beginning and powder house. Yeah. Powder house and Mount bachelor. And mm -hmm. you know, they, they feel a sense of pride that they get to see this brand everywhere now. And they were one of the first, right. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's it's an awesome feeling for both me and them as well. Sure, because you know, we get to share that. So, you know, right away I knew that that wasn't the way to go for me. So now let's see. Um, see, oh five, you were cold. You saw the opportunity. <laughs> you took the opportunity. You sewed. You sewed your dick off. Yeah, pretty uh, much. And then, um, when was your first employee? So uh, fast forward, uh, two thousand and eight is when I established a company mm -hmm. uh, 2011 so you just slinging oh these yeah, things slinging under face, table. yeah <laughs> totally i mean i was working i, I, I did that with bikes in oh, college yeah. i know it was, it was rough i was working three jobs you know i was working mm -hmm. you know all night jobs so i can do black strap during the day mm. um you know why would that matter you could do black strap at night can't you i mean you could but i you know most of the shops are open during the day and the people who buy were there during the day and oh you know, i see i was thinking on a manufacturing oh level. gotcha yeah. yeah and so i was just trying to figure out a way to like you know, work at night and, you mm -hmm. know, talk to these people in the day. Cause I, you know, one thing I was really good at was selling. Yeah. Right. And I knew I could sell, um, just now. Well, your about, dad was good at that too. Right. So is it, you're, um, 
his dad, Abe, yeah. um, Abe's dad owned Maza Bistro, for those of you who remember, and uh, fantastic food. Yep. And he'd go in and take care of you. And the thing I loved about your dad was that he, um, I had a great sense that he was selling me without selling me. Right. He was just having conversation. He was just telling, showing me this bakala or the tabbouleh. He introduced right. me to so many things in Middle Eastern cuisine right. that was just absolutely delicious. And he did it with a big smile on his face because he believed in it. Yeah, and that's it, right? He he taught me from a young age, right? If, if you're passionate about whatever you do, whether you're selling things or not, yeah. people are going to buy in to either you or to our product or to whatever you do because you're so passionate about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, I learned that at a, at a young age. You know, even though my dad didn't have a lot of sales jobs, um, I mean, he always put me with friends of his that you know, like I was selling things when I was you know nine years old for friends of his and stuff. Mm -hmm. So. It's uh, the salesperson came out of me, you know, by default of my dad <laughs> forcing me to kind of go that route, right? Which is probably the best attribute that he or anybody can teach you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he gave me the ability to sell or think quick on my feet. And, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody had a rebuttal to something, I could be able to like, you know, give them a good answer that, mm -hmm. you know, without really selling them, which was sure. the key. Um, so, you know, like we were saying, you know, I was, you know, fast forward, you know, 2009, 2010, I was you know, still learning like what a brand was and like how to operate a brand and uh, came down to uh, 2010, um, end of 2010, I was uh, at the Campus Rail Jam Tour here in Bend um, up at uh, the college and uh, I had a booth and uh, Jim Sanko, which was my first employee, which is still an employee with me today, mm -hmm. um, you know, fantastic human being. He uh, came up to my booth and he was really intrigued with what I was doing. You know, he was um, I, I like to joke with him a little bit because he's definitely a snowboarder first and then a college student second. Okay. Um, you know, he's very passionate about mm -hmm. snowboarding and, you know, he asked me at first, um, about interning and, uh, it was super funny, right? Cause I remember when I interviewed him, you know, we met at brother John's on the West side mm -hmm. and, uh, we each had a beer and I tried to make it this formal thing. And, and I knew right away that I wasn't, it, it wasn't going to be formal, right? It's like, Hey man, it's, you're going to come work in my one bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> are you okay? Are you okay with this? You know. Yeah. And so at first, you know, he interned for me and came over to my one bedroom, and uh, mm -hmm. we worked literally, you know, twelve inches apart from each other. And uh, at the time, I had eighteen stores that I was managing myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim came on, and uh, he lasted about three weeks. And he looked at me and he said, "Let's go on this road trip." You know, to all these, I know all these other stores in Oregon that, you know, because I was learning, you know, he had already been kind of exposed to that snowboard scene mm -hmm. and he grew up in Portland. So he knew all the shops and he's like, you gotta make me one promise though. If we land all these accounts, we have to get a warehouse because I can't work in your bedroom anymore. And, uh, at the time, you know, I was like, okay, I can make that happen, you mm -hmm. know? Um, you know, and I was pretty much a yes man at that point. Right. Sure. I, I, I'd say yes and then figure it out later. Yeah. So we went on that tour and we landed every single one of those accounts, which was awesome. <laughs> and uh, came back and busted out the credit card and got us a warehouse. So well, it turned out to be a great thing, though, because you it need was. you need to be able to spread your wings and get twelve inches away from Jim. Oh and yeah, continue to keep growing. Yeah. Um, so now today, how many times have you guys moved? <laughs> That's been, uh, so in Ben, you know, being a small town, yeah. we, uh, and we learned this kind of in the beginning, we didn't know, we, we started a business in the time of the crash, right? You know, we started in 2008. And, Which makes you more resilient. Yeah, I mean, it did. It, it, it helped me in many ways, right? Because I was able to get a warehouse for a lot cheaper than I can now. And, yeah. You know, and it, uh, it gave me, you know, only the place I could go was look up, right? Mm -hmm. I could only get better from here. It couldn't yeah. get worse. And so I figured. Um, also, you winning in that time just says a lot about the company's character and culture right. and who you guys are to win in that time when the country was at its worst since the Great Depression. Right. Um, I mean, meanwhile, you have companies that are starting, um, including mine, that are right. like, right, okay, everything's been going great, and I'm just getting wait. I, I'm personally, I mean, I'm not going to sit here being like, oh, I know what's coming. I don't. Right. Um, I just know to be ready for it because what does come is we're going to get hit in the mouth. And what's the plan for that? Right. Do you have cash flow put aside? I mean, that's the one thing that I always personally uh, make sure I keep for the company is like we have a good amount of cash flow covering payroll. Even though everything looks great, right. I don't care. I don't want to buy a bunch of crap because I want to make sure that we're making payroll and all that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, you want but to take you, care of your employees. and. But you guys yeah. went through that already. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing about it, right, is I didn't have to worry about a lot of that stuff, right? Because, yeah. again, it was, it was going kind of an uptick, right? And all I had to worry about at that time was making product, 
selling it and trying to build a company, right? Mm. It's, it's a different dynamic now where you have to worry about starting a business in a great time and exploding and then worrying about the economy crashing and going backwards. You know, so in some ways I look at it as, you know, a benefit that it actually helped me grow just because I, it's one worry I didn't have to worry about. Yeah. Then again, why worry about it? Is it going to make it go away? N- not really. I you mean, just plan for it. Yeah. I mean, I knew, you know, what I noticed, you know, the first five or six stores that we had, what I noticed like right away at the beginning is what it did, you know, what the recession did was, you know, people were still buying. They just weren't buying the same way. Habits were changing people, you know. Mm-hmm. And what I noticed these buyers were looking for were they finally realized like I'm buying all these products and they're not selling in a time like this. So I need to buy a product that sells in times like this but and sell even better in good times. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what the Blackstrap product did, right? Yeah. Is we were se- we were outselling all these brands in the worst of times and now it's like it's going gangbusters, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's, you know, I definitely think starting in that time was, uh, you know, is what made us a great success as well. How'd you, um, how'd you deal with your first uh, knockoff brand? Well, um, that's a good question, right? Is, you know, I remember sitting down and really stressing about it, right? Yeah. I remember, I mean, now we have a ton of knockoffs, right? Sure. And I stress about it daily. I mean, we have patents and trademarks and all these things that protect the brand, right? And, you know, one thing I took... Um, you know, from a book I read uh, from Sarah Blakely with Spanx, you know, one line, one line that I took from her, and it was really important, right, is if she spent all the time in the world battling these knockoffs and worrying about them, she wouldn't be able to progress as a brand. She wouldn't be the brand she is today if she was worrying about it. Mm-hmm. And so that's pretty much what we do is we, we continue to innovate mm-hmm. and we continue to change and morph with the market and we just stay ahead of the, you know, ahead of the trend, you yeah. know, and it's, it's proven really well for us, right, because people now call us, right? They're like, oh, hey, there's this brand that looks very similar. It's not your fabric, it's not your thing 100%, but it's very similar. And, uh, you know, we we joke and we, you know, they don't buy it, you know, because yeah. they they love the Blackstrap brand. And I think that's the way we, you know, we you know we definitely back the specialty industry. We, we back all the mom and pops mm-hmm. out there and they now back us, which is super awesome. Well, imitation is the biggest form of flattery. Oh, 100%. Right? Um, yeah. And that's what... Uh, you know, I, I, I ran across that a lot when it just comes into our world of like digital marketing and uh, the lucky, I, we actually, Mitch and I, we were talking about this today, um, about competition and um, another person that um, I'm training in sales was asking me, is like, are you looking at like what are the other digital marketing agencies are doing, this, this and that? And I was just like, yeah, I'm really not. And I never really have. And I don't think I ever will. Um, and it's not of because I don't really care what they're doing, even though I don't, so I guess maybe that's the thing. Right. <laughs> it's that I'm concerned about what we're doing, always. And so I've heard of people being like, oh, they're now doing that thing that you're doing, oh, they're now offering that. And then after Mazama started to become successful here in Ben, right. uh, there wasn't really that many digital marketing agencies at all in Ben, and now there's a bunch, and yep. I just don't care. And actually, I've helped digital marketing agencies. Um, I've helped owners of like one in uh, Michigan when he called me up. I was just wondering how to get in. I talked to him. I was like, okay, so what's going on? And he told me and I was able to help him get around a couple of big pitfalls. Like you don't want to do that. No, you don't need a lawyer for that. You right. don't need this, this and that. Um, I mean, that's the beauty of it, right? Mm-hmm. You're, you're the one that's innovating and you're the one that's trend setting and you're the kind of one of the first in that sense. And so now you feel comfortable to be able to give some of that knowledge to somebody else because you know that you still are going to be ahead of the trend. Oh, the game's going to yeah. be different tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, right, like, this the this company started posting pictures of, like, pizza and cats and mm-hmm. saying, come to our bowling alley, <laughs> and now they're out there engineering bots that seem like people. Right. Like, holy crap, like, it's it's really cool. And, and I, don't, I can't even tell you I have an idea, but a year from now, it's going to change from even that. Right. Like, that will still probably be a tool of ours, but, I mean, I'm paying real close attention to things like... Uh, TikTok right. and um, uh, I got you know when Mark Zuckerberg gave me an Oculus and mm-hmm. I keep on getting in there just thinking it hasn't really took off yet in an advertising mm-hmm. perspective but I'm thinking about it a right. lot like thinking for like you right now like if I'm playing like a snowboard game and I could just see like what's that guy wearing on his face right. click Facebook shop all right cool I bought that it'll be in the mail I'll keep on going all right that could be a, a real reality depending on how much small they make those things. Uh, voice. I'm not a big fan that that took off. Right. But it has. It, yeah. And so. And the point too is you're staying ahead of the trend. Right? Trying to. Yeah. And, and again, uh, uh, 
forever changing trend, right? So that's the way we look at it in our business, right? It's, we'll just, you know, it's, you can't, you can only reinvent the wheel so many times with, you know, active accessories and mm -hmm. things like that, but it's how can we innovate? How can we change how, you know, we innovate in other ways. It's not just product, right? It's how can we change how there, are these are being sold? How yeah. can we help the environment in a better way and change how these things are marketed or produced? Is that it's, really important to you? It is, you know, we, Why? Yeah, I mean, for the playground that we have here in Bend and for it to be around for like my kids and my kids, kids, I mean, you have to take care of it. Right? So that's the real reason. I mean, the real reason. I for, think it's a good reason. I'm it, just asking. It's, it's a fantastic reason, right? It's, you know, there's we, just some entrepreneurs that do it because marketing and things like that, yeah. you know, I, I get it. Right. But in reality, a lot of the green initiatives that we do cost us money. Right, it costs us more than you know we make. You know, sometimes we save and we get the benefit of both. Like I laugh at the you know? hotels that say like, "Oh, if you don't wash your towels and you know you're right, going you're green, saying, and, yeah, and yeah. like oh, you shut up." Yeah, for us, it, yeah, right. <laughs> for us, it was just really about like how can we really just lower our impact, right? And so one of the strategies we use at our company is, and we, we don't advertise this a lot, but it's what can we do that's green on the back end? So, for so example. What are you doing? So, oh man, where do we start? So, um, I love that saying and love. One, I'll start with our newest initiative that we did this year. So, which turned out to be it's a double benefit for us. Okay, it's our repurpose fabric program. Okay, and so basically what we do is we take you know we have hundreds of thousands of pounds of fabric scraps that used to end up in a landfill, right? Because when you're cutting products, there's always leftovers. Sure, and you'll actually see it on one of the slides here when it goes by. So basically, what we did is we took the scraps and mm -hmm. we repurposed them that. and yep and we turned it into other products so that's actually a picture yep. of uh one of our uh, adult ball of clavas that Can we you make, make it stay on that somehow and if you click on it it actually takes you to whole our whole repurpose program and basically what happens is we turn them into goggle covers uh, for oh, the snow market sweet and so we gave them a new life right because you know we see a lot of companies out there that are using recycled fabrics and things like that and you know, sometimes they're created in a green way, sometimes they're not. And so we thought the way we could make uh, this product. Stripping guards. Yeah, so for the fly fishing market when you're. Uh, I'm not a fly fisherman. Yeah, right. when you're stripping streamers and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, you get line burn and or you wanted to figure out ways to clean your fly line. So we made guards that go over your fingers, um, which is actually a product that was being sold regularly in the market. And we just thought, hey, we'll make it a green thing. Well, holy shit. How much are you selling that for? Uh, stripping guards are $7.99 at retail. From something that you were throwing away. Yep, from something we were throwing away. And in reality, that particular product, we make zero money on. We just do it as a way to keep products out of a landfill. So. Okay, great. Yeah. You make $8.99 and all of a sudden you're making money out of it. That's right, <laughs> right. Even, that's pretty cool. Yep. Uh, what about the goggle protectors? So the goggle covers, those actually took off in a crazy way, right? They look really dope. I yeah, can see why. So it's, you know, it's a way to protect your lenses. Uh, people wear them apres ski. They, uh -huh. they, it's a new way for them to stylize the way they look. Uh -huh. um, you know, they put them on top of their helmets. Uh, ski with them on just oh, to show you. Yeah, bold. right. We actually did that for a customer. <laughs> it was really funny. We uh, we actually put please remove before use on there because um, they thought it was funny because they actually had a customer that was wearing them out with, when they walked out the door. It's like, don't do that. Oh my God. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so, so far this year, I mean, we launched this program two and a half months ago mm -hmm. and uh, 34,000 pounds have been saved from a landfill already just from that product alone um, we're hoping to hit over a hundred thousand pounds uh, by next year so I guess that, you gotta feel pretty good about that oh yeah it's fantastic you know it's that's that's awesome. that sort of uh area in business where like you're really doing good and like you're not even making money but you don't care but it does come back on your pnl oh, i believe 100%. because my theory on this and and, and put in word uh you want but is that significantly helping your morale within the company or it, not. It does, right? Because so, you know, not only have I always been tried to be green in whatever we do, right. the employees we've been hiring are, you know, especially being from Ben, they're very passionate about being green. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they go out and they help the trail alliance with trails, you know, for and mountain bike trails and we we clean up trash and we volunteer and we do all kinds of things, right? And most of these initiative initiatives at our office has happened because employees wanted it. Mm -hmm. um, and this green initiative was really a thing that they were pushing us to do, you know, figuring out ways to truly be green, right? Don't just buy a recycled fabric and make it into another thing. Like how can we truly be green and keep things from getting into the landfill? Cause that's the problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, we can make as many products as you want, but if we don't stop them from getting there in the first place, we're going to have an issue. What about, um, when it comes to use black straps? That like one thing that I see that is a bit of a problem when it comes right. to um, 
the fashion industry, yep. not just snow, but fashion is like, I know people who I won't name who have to get new everything every year. And yep. I'm just sitting there like, A, that's incredibly expensive. 100%. But B, w- w- why? Like what what kind of a waste is that that doing? And, and Goodwill can actually only take so much right, stuff. Right. Like they've actually like refused, like when that uh, minimalist show came yep, out on Netflix, yep, like yep, they were stop. They saying yeah. stop because yeah. people have that much crap. Right. We have a trillion dollar industry based on storing our shit. Yep. Hundred percent. Yeah. Right. So how? I'll just leave it back at to to you. On is there a way? It's probably not good for your business, but I mean, realistically, what we've noticed is, I mean, we've seen customers. No, no joke. You know those first fifty face masks I I sewed. I sewed them a particular way. I still you saw see one them. in a landfill. I no. I still <laughs> I'm definitely with, not yeah, there. I'm right. Playing with you. Uh, I still see them at Mount Bachelor. Right. That's sweet. And. You know, one thing what I do you le- do when you see one at Mount oh, I mean, I don't say anything, right? I'm not gonna be that guy, but it, you know, I definitely. I would be that guy. I would be like, right. I so that, right. dude. It's so cool you have that. Do you know how old that is? Right. Uh, yeah. I do get a. Uh, yeah, I get super nostalgic about it, yeah. you know, and I am that creeper that like follow him down the hill, so I can just see it a few <laughs> more times and make sure it's the one. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's one thing I knew from the beginning is when we built a product, it had to be good. Mm-hmm. And that's actually great feedback we get from our customers is we build a really solid product. You know, in com- we've had less than five returns in company history ever. And they were all not our fault. They were all like, oh, we cut it by five accident. Five returns? Yeah. How many have you sold total? 20? Oh, uh, 20. I, I mean, <laughs> I hope it's more than 20 by this point. What is it like? No, seriously. Uh, I think yesterday we were talking about we hit 6 million units. Holy shit. Yeah. And uh, it was a... Six million. Yeah. It was a really big milestone for us. Yeah. It's a huge and, milestone for any company. Yeah. And to have that kind of a return rate, I mean, you know, even down to our factory. Six million to five. I don't even know what that math would come out to. It'd be like point zero 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 something. Zero, zero, zero. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's fantastic, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the number of feedback we get from everybody, right? Is, you know, not only do we make pretty good products at a good price, but we make products that last and what it's turned into is you know you would think you'd get this customer that's like i need the new one every year but you know what they're doing is they're keeping the old one so we have customers that own 10 of these things right and they start to interchange how they look and how they feel on that day or what outerwear do they have this year and what outerwear do they have that you know that Mm -hmm. year and it's been really really cool i mean we you know we have a very low production um error rate as well it's really low have you heard about people like tossing them i I mean, I'm assuming it's going to happen, right, right, out there. But, you know, we do have a couple other green initiatives that we do. Um, you know, we don't do it with everybody, but we do it across the country. Like, we have a recycled packaging initiative. So what we do is every black strap that's sold, like at a resort especially, if the customer's going to wear it right there, we ask them to cut the product off the packaging. And then at the end of the year, they mail us back boxes of the packaging and we reuse it mm. um, as a way to be green. And so at first, you know, people didn't like it stores especially because they would have different kinds of packaging in their store right because we update like the art or whatever but now it's turned into the how old how many times was this package reused right and it turned into a really cool thing and then we we incentivize them by giving them a discount on their next order or whatever Um, we we also do a program and we've done it at a few resorts and we're trying to initiate uh, initiate this program is where it's like if somebody wants to get rid of their old black strap come and don't come and donate at the shop ship it back to us and then we'll give it to like a you know, we'll give it to like a you know Bethlehem yeah, Inn yeah, or a homeless yeah, yeah, yeah. shelter. You yeah. know, we we donate all of our seconds to homeless shelters across the country. We do that every year to keep people warm. So, you know, you know, we also don't want to put things into a landfill as much as we can. That's sweet. Um, yeah, my my issues from the beginning with uh, habit is on like, can I? And so far, we are do a product without any plastic. So um, the only the, the top's aluminum, uh, things glass. Uh, and that little plastic thing that would yep. go in the throttle yep. back the hot sauce. Yep. I said no. No, it's fantastic. It's a yeah. good idea. I mean, I, I, mean I, maybe I shouldn't have. There's going to be some crusty stuff coming off the side, but it just went into. I, I was like, I don't want those things going in turtles' noses. No. And I, I, right, and I think it looks cooler too. Anyway, it gives. Yeah. I gives. It gives it a, you know, more classy look than a plastic yeah. bottle for sure. Yeah, and so as we continue, but the thing is, is that I'm sure you ran into this as you want to because the environment. I'm. You know, I don't go out and actively hug trees, but I care a lot right. about them. And I, like, I get depressed when I see um, new plots of land that were trees get taken down. Right. Um, I get depressed when I hear about what's going on with our oceans and just how we're just like cancer on this planet. Right. And so the last thing that I want to do is find a way. That's actually one of the things um, that 
when, when Mazama started, one of the main things I actually pushed that nobody really cared about, and I was like, hey, you don't need to pay for newspaper or smart shop or stuff anymore. We got this stuff digital, right. like it's okay, like nothing against, I mean, against them, but I was, and I wasn't trying, or, or the Yellow Pages right. was actually still a thing oh, six yeah. years ago. People were still in it, it was crazy. Right. But anyway, they started page two hundred forty-six. Yeah, and I was and I was just like, you don't. That was one of the issues. I mean, it's not one that we have anymore. But that was the thinking I had. And so now, going this, where I was, where I was going with this is, as you're growing the business, I know I'm going to. I don't know what it is yet, but there's going to be a decision right. that's gonna go. That's like, gosh, it's just gonna be so much easier. It's gonna be less time. I'm gonna save a ton of money. But that's. God, that's going to be not as good for the environment. I think you nailed it on the head, right? Is it all comes, especially as business owners, right? It all comes down to, you know, like, are we going to be the most green all the time? Probably not, no. right? But if you're consciously making decisions to like make the best possible ones you can daily, that's the best we can do, right? And if we have more companies and more businesses doing that, I think that's where we can really make an impact, right? And that's what we do daily, right? You know, every decision we make, um, environment is part of our decision making right like right. are we going to be less of an impact is it going to be more of an impact you know and there's not a law making you do that there's not a law making me make habit be zero plastic right i'm just like that's what i want to do and that's what you want to do you want to have zero waste going into landfills because that's freaking sweet and we have a landfill problem 100 percent. nobody like that's the thing that um a lot of people sometimes really like to go off about like businesses need to be regulated this is i'm like Okay, sure, some, but do you not notice like how much businesses like end up regulating the good that you're wanting? Totally. You're wanting things to be green, but businesses are figuring out a way to do that because right. they see that that's where the market demand is and that's the right thing to do. Yeah. The organic movement is a great one I like to right. point out. That didn't, there just wasn't a law nope. that said time to eat organic. Everybody was just like, I'm, I'm done eating pesticides and now right. the majority of Fred Meyer and Safeway is organic. Right, yeah. and it's, you know, like, is it a double-edged sword a little bit? Does it? I mean, does it have to be a trend to make it happen? Yes. Oh, yeah. Right? That's why but there's no more plastic at least straws, right? Right? At least we're on the right <laughs> trend, though, right? I like yeah. the fact that this is becoming the thing, right? It's it's a good way to go. 100%. Because if it's not, then we're going to be skiing on a landfill one day. Yeah. I skied on a landfill in Chicago. Right. It's called Wilmot Mountain. And we and I grew up in Chicago. And... Uh, is literally an overused landfill that they put a ski lift on. That was the biggest topography around. Right. Uh, but you know what? They made a use of another space, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. That's the most positive thinking I've ever heard on that, yeah, I guess. You, you, got, you got to, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about um, uh, growing businesses in Bend really quick. Okay. Um, start with like the challenges of it that people that are that could be watching us here, like how it's hard well, let's see. I mean, I would say for any business owner, right, starting a business in a small town is amplified, mm -hmm. right, compared to, you know, ha having started in like an L.A. area or New York, right, just because the lack of industry in any, sure. any which place, right? Employees, industry, Empl yeah. uh, potential clients. I mean, when it comes to Blackstrap, you have Mount Bachelor and like two or three other yeah, at the stores. Time, at the time, there was more. Yeah, it's um, weird how the town grew, but the shop shrank. Yeah, you know, the, it's you know, recession hit everybody hard, and mm -hmm. you know, the good ones stayed around, which is awesome. And some of the ones that couldn't hang on couldn't hang on, or they made different decisions for their life. Um, but which start, is fine. Yeah, which is fine. You yeah. know what I mean? It's you know, you know, all the business that we've done in Bend, it's always been with the right ones. Um, but starting a business in Bend was definitely amplified, right? It was, um, you know where do I get this or how do I do this? And it, surprisingly born out of necessity, it's like, you know, our sewing facility is down in LA and our milling fabric uh, facility is in New York. And because none of this stuff is on the West coast or none of it's on, none of it's in the Northwest. Right. And so, you know, but Ben was always a place that we wanted to be. Right. And it was for the simple fact mm -hmm. that it was the best uh, testing grounds that I feel in the country. Right. We get all crazy weather patterns, Cascade Mountains are 10 minutes from us in reality, you know, mm -hmm. 10, 20 minutes. And I knew this was a place where I wanted to start an outdoor brand because I could get outdoor like-minded people to come work with us, right? And, yeah, but and give some validity to our products. I'm going to push back a little bit. You came okay. here being like, I'm going to start Blackstrap? No, I mean, once I had the idea that I wanted to do a business, yeah. that's where like, I'm, like, in the I'm, right, at, I'm in the right you're place. You're in the right yes. place. So I pretty much moved here because I grew up in a concrete jungle. Yeah, right, and I felt I mean. like I was born in the wrong place. Who was place. your concrete jungle? I was born in Orange County, Los Angeles area, and yeah. you know I remember having to. At least you know, yours was warm. 
It was warm, but you know, I had to go three, four hours to get snowboarding, you know, to go to Mountain High or go to, you yeah. know, go to Big Bear or Mammoth. You know, I had to drive eight hours, right? And so being, you know, I always grew up, you know, I skateboarded and I snowboarded and Ben just was like, blew my mind that I could be 20 minutes and on a chairlift, sure. you know what I mean? And, you know, and it was not too small of a town. Like it had, you know, a great feel. It still mm -hmm. had a lot of the amenities I needed, you know, yeah. cause I was still young at the time, you know, I, you know, I moved here when I was what, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but being here and starting a business is like once I built those first face masks, I kind of was like, okay, this is the place I want to be, right? Because I can give some validity to our products that we make and I can create a business, hopefully, that kind of lives and breathes the product, mm -hmm. right? You know, like when people say like, oh, does this stuff really work? We can be like, yes, we use it every day, you know, kind of thing. So that's where, you know the idea for starting a business in Bend really like took hold. Now the hard part was figuring out the logistics of that. Um, you know, and that's where I really think the strength of our business has happened over the last eight years or so is that we, you know, we built a really strong supply chain because we had to figure out how to operate and mend, hmm. you know, uh, what, what size warehouse do we need or how are we going to get shipping out of here? And in the last eight years, Ben has changed a lot. I would say for, you know, new business owners starting here that are building a product and having to ship from here, it's a lot easier than it was eight, 10, 12 years ago. Yeah. For sure. Um, do you feel, Abe? Do you do you do you feel like you have any um, new responsibilities um, now that Blackstrap is well established? And I'm not talking about within your company. Obviously, new responsibilities happen as you're growing. I'm saying, uh, do you feel like do you have, do you have responsibilities to bend? Responsibilities to bend. I mean, or Central Oregon. Yeah, we do. You know, I mean. Because we promote Bend as a place that we live, work, and play, mm -hmm. right? Do responsibilities or obligations? I, I don't know how you put it. I, do I feel a, ne a need to want to make this place a better place? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, do I do I have a strong voice when it comes to like you know our housing crisis a little bit, or do I you know do I try to go and clean the trails because you know that they're getting used more? Do I have a voice when you know our trails are not getting taken care of and that kind of stuff? Because Ben has changed so much in the last ten years. I do. And you do, yeah. So you're using that. I do. I do. I mean, and do I feel like you know being a business owner here gives me a little bit more? potency than just being somebody else I, I do i think i can get to the right people a little bit better and voice my opinion on certain things and i do feel a responsibility for that what about responsibilities to um uh other businesses that are trying to grow that's uh i'm glad you asked me about that that's a big one that's a big one for me you know uh this is where we joked about the cool guy factor you know is <laughs> I got cool yeah. guy a lot at the beginning, you know, and yeah. I'll elaborate let's a little bit. Yeah, let's yeah, elaborate, I'll, I'll elaborate cool a little guy. bit. You know, the cool guy factor is, you know, I, you know, I'd write an email to somebody and they were very nice on email, right? Mm -hmm. And they were willing to talk to me. And the minute I met them in person in a group surrounding, they cool guide me, right? They gave me kind of the cold shoulder or made me feel very small or ignored me. So in this kind of scenario, you'd be like, um, hey, blank company who's successful, I would like to, would you mind if you taught me a few things? I had some questions on X, Y, and Z. Totally. And they say, yeah, absolutely come in at this time. And they seem so nice. And then you come in and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this, and that. But I'm kind of busy. Yeah, I'm kind of busy. And they turn me away. Or they would say, they'd stick me with an intern and say, he might be able to answer some of your questions. And, you know, and, and I'm not blaming them 100%, right? They're busy people. And, you know, at the time I was, you know, thankful that they'd even take an email from me. Sure. Um, you know, so, you know, but with that, we were able to, you know, that's a big one for me because now we have a policy at Blackstrap that when anybody comes in, whether they're selling something or they want, they need help with a certain project, we're always, you know, open to it. Like we give them the time of day. We're respectful for their time. If they're taking the time to talk to us, we're going to take the time to talk to them back. Um, you know, you're times not gonna, of, you're not going to cool guy anybody. We don't, we don't cool guy yeah. anybody. No, we're, you know, and we do a lot of work for people here, Ben, you know, we, mm -hmm. you know, we print, um, you know, for some local backpack companies, we print their backpacks. We mm -hmm. do some, uh, uh, we print some other companies' backcountry gear, and we're all about that kind of stuff. And now, what by a byproduct of that is a lot of companies write us emails like, "Hey, I have this new idea. Could you guys apply it?" Or, "Hey, uh, you know, we want to build this new thing. Can you help us with that?" You know, and it's it's been really cool to be able to see like all these young new entrepreneurs that are coming out with crazy cool ideas. And, you know, for me to sometimes be a part of those ideas and help them and mm -hmm. just point them in the right direction feels really awesome. 
Yeah, I would. Um, so I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, I luckily, I'm trying to think of a time. I, I, I've always been helped a lot. There's been. No, I've been luckier than you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I never really came into people's um, off. I've gotten cool guide. When I was trying to, never mind. I, I haven't been like I, I got I got cool guy all the time. When you, I was growing my business, I got cool guy all the time. Do you think Do you think it happened to be also in the times that we started? Right, like I think part of the reason why I was cool guy a lot too is that people I was are start, stressed out of their yeah, mind. Yeah, you know, I was starting in the time <laughs> where people were like laying off employees, and it was like I don't have the time for this kind of thing. You know what I mean? I felt that a lot in the places I went, or they had bigger things on their mind. Yeah. Um, there was a, I mean, I didn't get cool guide all the time. You know, I had a lot of companies out there that were willing to give me information or help me. You know what I mean? But I would definitely say it was a 90, 10, you know? I don't know. I, the, how I'd push back on that would only be on the scenarios that I have. I mean, we don't, uh, unfortunately we don't have a cool guy stat chart where right. we can go and see right. what the correlations are. But one that I've had on uh, recently on help that I've been getting is from people like Gary Fish, uh, yep. uh, who's the CEO and founder of Deschutes and Jamie uh, Danik, uh, founder of Hum. Yep. And they both have been helping me personally a lot of time being a mentor on getting, um, habit off the ground. Well, the reason I bring them up in an example is they both went through huge cutbacks. Yep. Uh, Jamie is actually on the podcast, like almost, she almost came to tears just reminiscing about when she had to terminate, I forgot how many people it was, what, it was like 50 or 60 or something like that. And it's got to be, it's got to be the worst feeling, you know what I mean? Oh, she broke down and cried and everything. And so, and that was just like a few months before. So, you know, they're not out of the woods. And then Gary uh, basically did the same thing. Yep. Um, and at the same time. And so I'm just, um, I'm just sitting with them after this, post this, and I'm, I guess I'm happy that I didn't get cool guide, right. but, um, I could totally see why they would. Right. Like, they I'm trying to keep my company right. alive right now. Right. Uh, if I do get my company back and being alive, then let's, let's talk again right. so I can get it. Um, but I got cool guide in the beginning, uh, by, um, a lot of businesses that just want to give me the time of day. Right. Um, I think that could have been more of like a sales thing. Like, well, there's an annoying. Yeah, but see, that's a, that, that's a cool guy factor, right? It's, you know, we have a lot of salesmen that come into our offices for social media, for other things. Mm -hmm. Right. And I tell all my guys and they know this is one of the rules when I hire people, it's like, they're just, they're doing their job. Right. So if they take the time out of their day to come and sell you, you know, you take the time to respectfully listen. And if you like what they got, then take it sure. a step further. And if you don't respectfully tell them why, I mean, it's, it's simple, right? It's, you never want to make some, you know, cause you never know where that person's at, right? You don't want to make somebody feel bad about what they're selling or what they're doing. Right. Because who knows, right. They might, they might be the next cool product or the next salesperson for something more important someday. Right. And they, you can smash them right at the beginning. You don't want to do that. Or they could be a client of yours. hundred percent. You know, And in five years they could end up getting a job or in two years they can end up getting a job. Honestly, this is how the world works. Right. They get a job being the buyer at Mount bachelor. You know, and, actually, I actually have a funny story about that. A situation yeah. that happened exactly like so be this. be nice. Basically. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So no, it's, a, it's, it's a really funny story. So this exact, that exact scenario happened to me. Um, it was the third account I ever had, which was Sun River Sports in Sun River. And I was driving back from Bend and it was, you know, dusk and a truck in front of me. I saw these two elk that came out on the highway and the truck in front of me, they ran across the highway. Mm -hmm. um, they hit the elk. And I remember, I'll never forget it. It was like slow motion. I drove under the elk as it came over me. Oof. Oh yeah. It was scariest thing ever. But I remember the only thing on my mind was like, I hope the person in front of me was okay. Cause it was crazy. And it was a young gal. She got out of the car and I stayed with her and I called an ambulance and the whole bit. About a week later, I went into Sun River Sports and there was this older gal in the front and I said, oh, hey, I'm looking for the buyer. Same kind of situation I was going before. I'm looking for the buyer. <laughs> yeah. And, and the older gal was a little standoffish. She was trying to cool guy me a little bit. And she said, uh, she said, oh, we don't need any of that right now. And I started saying something else. And I remember all I heard from the back room was, whatever that guy's got, I'm buying <laughs> and she walked out and it was the same girl that I helped. Yeah. And she's like, I don't care what you're selling. I'm going to buy everything you got. And it, it was awesome. You know, what um, I mean? well, so what you were doing, um, when it came to helping the girl, uh, is for oxytocin, the right. chemical release, you right. know, going into, uh, and when you go and you help other people, um, selflessly, it doesn't need to come back. You weren't looking for it to come back. Not at all. Actually. And yeah. it just 
does, whether you believe in karma or not, like right. the more good that you do in this world, I am more and more convinced as I've like been turning a leaf in my right. life of going from gonna build a build a hundred million dollar agency and get the fuck out of my way <laughs> right. to let's do the right thing. Right. There's actually something I'm gonna be announcing to them um, tomorrow. Very cool. So you, you stay quiet on this, <laughs> my good friend Mitch. You know what's coming. Oh. Yeah. He the the reason he knows is because uh, one of my other um, a uh, a guy on LinkedIn who's really been in col uh, culture. His name is James Boeing. Okay. He and I just kind of go back and forth. He runs a dealership in DC, cool. and we've like hit it off just by like doing the right thing and culture first and all that sort right. of stuff. And in the most ridiculous environment, to toxic environment, uh, as a rule, the industry of automotive right. dealerships. I bet it's pretty, yeah. Not good cultures. Right. You end up working, what's normal is you work six to seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day. Sounds about right. And yeah, and, and that that's, that's normal. So you're lucky when you have a day off. Mm -hmm. Well, he launched it successfully with the biggest October ever after doing it, four day work week. Oh, wow. And I just went, wait, you did what? And so we were in Vegas and Mitch was with us as I, we broke this stuff down and I was just like, there's no reason why I can't do this for my team. And so tomorrow I'm going to, so we're going to do it on a trial. It's going to be, oh, yeah. um, it's going to go from January to April 1st. And um, it just seems like, what do I really have to lose? I mean, in reality, right, everybody's craving more time, right? Mm -hmm. And if they can be as you know passionate about their days off, they come back to work feeling as more passionate, right? Yeah. You know, we, you know, we've played around with stuff like that. You know, the problem is, is our industry is very much, you know, most of them are ski shops, so they're nine to five. They want to get a hold of us at some capacity. Oh, nine we'll to six. still be open. Yeah, but you're gonna. It's just uh, they'll be they'll, they'll be their choice. <laughs> they can get here. I want it to be a surprise. Right. Yeah. Also, please remember to videotape tomorrow's morning because I think it'll be great getting their reaction. But it'll be um, they could do four tens oh, or cool. do what they're doing now. Oh, cool! But Giving the, them the option that's kind of mm -hmm. cool. And then we worked it out. My partner and I, Sarah, we worked out the schedule where there will always be like a manager to cover like the because people will take yeah. off either Monday or Friday, mm -hmm. and uh, other people's accounts will be covered. And we're like, okay, this should. And I guess we'll. I mean, stay that's tuned. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. We'll, we'll see, see what happens. What happens. Yeah, yeah we're, we're doing something this year finally to – we're reinvigorating our, uh, you know, our snow policy, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, everybody that – most everybody that works for us are skiers or snowboarders, right? So trying to figure out a way to get them on hill more because, you know, I notice every time they get to go ski or snowboard even during a work day and then they come back, they just work that much harder. Right, you know, they're yeah. Pa they're more passionate about what they're doing. So we have a powder policy here too. I mean, yep. what what's the book that we both have read um, that I'm blanking on right now? Patagonia. Oh. Uh, oh, no. Uh, let the people go surfing. Oh, yep. Yeah. That'll, and, that's a tough one. They have a great policy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when you implement it like early enough, then people – when your culture lives on that way, yep. then you can be coming successful by just like doing what is good and right. And then these things end up coming back. So yep. by the culture shifting, um, we're about to sign a pretty large client. Um, cool. One of our, it'll be one of our bigger accounts. Um, and the reason we'll be signing them is because a guy overheard um, just asked one of my, not a saleswoman, just one of our um, uh team members here asking her what she does and because she answered so passionately and loved everything she's doing they sold. came in yeah they were sold before i even talked to them yeah and i was just like huh that's one of our that's cool it's one of our it's <laughs> one of our big things the culture at our place is getting everybody to take care of everybody else you know what mm -hmm. i mean don't put yourself first put the team first you know what i mean and have you know care and you know and you know, when people want to have days off, like we promote that, like go take a day off, go take a week off. And like, how do you, how do you make sure people do that though? Cause uh, you, you know, those people that like will keep on working until yeah, they burn you know, out. Do you those, have a way of spotting that? Yeah, I know you I'm, are I'm one of those people. Right. So it's like, I definitely learned over the last two years that you have to lead by example. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, which always, means you have to take time off. Yeah, I know. And it's, I've always been that guy, right? Like I work every day, you know, even on my days off, I'm working, you know what I yeah. mean? And and I started to notice that I was developing, I wouldn't say it's a bad culture. Um, it definitely 
was a strong work ethic culture. Uh, a lot of my team would work hard and stay late, which is awesome, right? It showed how passionate they were about our about the brand and the success of our brand. But then I started to notice that they would skip events or question asking me if they could go to an event like, mm -hmm. you know, a wedding, you know, and things like that. And, you know, so I started to realize that because I worked so hard that and I wasn't leading by example, right? And so I, I still take the least amount of days off from everybody, but I take days off and I promote them to take days off. So I initiated, uh, we have a, I call it a ding policy. It's they have to take all their vacation days every year or they get dinged for the next year. They lose a day. So we, no shit. yeah, so I, I, I really promote people to take, whether you're sick or you want to just go have fun or leave early on a Friday, use your, use your PTO, use mm. it, use it. You know, because part How much of that PTO do you have? I mean, technically, I'm not on a PTO plan, I know, but I probably but if have you, if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. You know, but they might, thousands if, of if, hours. No, no, I know oh. not that though. If you were to hold, like, let's say, um, what would be a realistic uh, for a person in your role, not exactly, but a leadership executive at Blackstripe? How many uh, that's been there for a long time, right? How many? Um, oh, we, we how, give, many, how many weeks should you have? We give six to seven weeks, depending. We have six weeks on P, on paid time off, then we give a week for sick. So okay, we have a pretty healthy PTO policy. No, that's pretty epic. Yeah. How many do you take? Uh, me this year, I've taken about two weeks or so. Right. So does that mean next year you get negative two weeks off? Probably. It should be that way. You know, the problem is, is you know. I'm still building a brand. It's you, building a company. And while I've... You always will be. Yeah. My team is more autonomous than they've ever been before. It's it's an amazing feeling to be able to step away. I'm feeling a little more comfortable these days to step away for three or four days at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember when my son was born, you know, I took two days off and I was right back at work. You know what I mean? Which I, I regret now a little bit just because, you know, I love that little human. But, How old uh, is he now? He's two now. And even more now, right? Because now he just wants to hang out with dad all the time. You know, yeah. it's, I, I feel a need to want to take more time off. Um, you know, and I do, I do it well. I do it between Friday and Fridays and Mondays, so I can have long weekends with him. Um, what would happen though? I mean, nothing bad would happen. I know. You know what I mean? It, it, it would be just fine. But you know, one of the things I you know will say is our team operates well when I'm there. Um, in the sense of we continue to innovate and change and bounce ideas off of, you know, some of our team members work so hard that they forget to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, my thing, right? I bring, I kind of bring the different dynamic of groups that we have and I bring them all together into one group, you know, and so. So you got to find somebody that's good at that too. It's true. Yeah. It'll happen. I have my own problem, man. I, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not trying to sit here being like, well, this, is, I mean, yeah. I have that same problem in sales. Mitch is right. hopefully going to help out with that. <laughs> Right now, it, it, it's pretty. It's just me. Um, Mitch is getting better and better, but um, and that's a that's a big bottleneck. But the operations thing, I'm happy that that's figured out. Like that's completely autonomous, uh, finance autonomous, HR hiring, like all that. But I, I gotta, I can't take off like right. Uh, well, I can, and I have, I'm and trying, I will take I'm off like a month. I'm trying to retrain my brain a little bit, right? I think part of the problem, part of the problem for me is. You know, I love snowboarding, right? And I still love skateboarding and I love mm -hmm. mountain biking. I love doing all those things, right? Sure. But I think I got addicted to Blackstrap. I go to work every day and I watch these people and I get so happy just watching people work. Like it has mm -hmm. nothing to do with selling and it has nothing to do with making new products or anything like that. I, I just get really excited about watching this thing that I started in my bedroom and watching, it's like a colony of bees, right? Everybody's doing their thing and they're doing it on their own. And I think I got addicted to that a little bit where, mm -hmm. you know, I just felt so good being at work, watching these people do these things that I forgot how to enjoy the days off, right? Because I was thinking about work, like what are they doing and how are they doing it, right? And so I'm retraining my brain and relearning to, you know, it's okay to disconnect from work for a day. It's still going to be there. Yeah. Right. And go and enjoy my day off and then go back and get to see the colony even stronger. How are you, you trying know? to, how are you trying to retrain yourself on that? I mean, I'm forcing myself. So I pretty much, I'll turn off my phone or, um, you know, when I need to do this, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. So, <laughs> so yeah. So originally, yeah. you know, I used, I'd answer emails and phone calls all night long. You know what I mean? And so, and my wife's helped a lot with this. You know, we have like a no phones at the dinner table. We eat dinner at the dinner table every day with our son, you know, mm -hmm. no phones, things like that. But pretty much I have a seven o'clock policy. After seven o'clock PM, 
my phone so, is off for work. Yeah. And it was hard for me, right? You know, I work in an industry where people need answers now and they work all the hours of the night. And yeah. so it's been a lot of training, but it's it's been good. You know, it's been good. And now I get to see my, you know, my guys do it, right? And That's they're starting, a really good thing. Yeah, it's yeah. good. What about uh, weekends? Weekends, I still work here and there, but I think people have learned also, which is helping over the last year, that mm -hmm. to, to try not to bother me. And that's the cool thing about my team, right, is they so much want the company to succeed that they do everything in their power not to bother me, right? They, they, want, they want to get the answers themselves and, you know, and, and it's okay, right? You know, my, they know my rule, right? My rule is I don't care if you make mistakes. Mistakes are going to happen mm -hmm. as long as I know you're giving it your all. So that's what they do every day, right? They just give it their all and I let them figure it out. And it's been a great, great learning experience over the last year. So why don't have these things made in China? Why not have them made in China? You want the easy or the long answer? Long, I'll give you the long answer. Yeah, give I'll give the semi-long answer. Yeah. In reality, I, I was pretty naive at the time. Like I knew a lot of products were made overseas, right? Mm -hmm. But I just thought that's the way you did it. I, did, I didn't know how to go to China and, you know, I mean, people were still faxing me orders back then, right? Like, really? email, yeah, I mean, email wasn't a crazy thing yet. There was a lot of phone calls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I just, I didn't think, I didn't think about it, honestly. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I was going to go to China and meet a factory and have them do these things, right? And, and I remember a lot of people scared me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. They're like, you know, don't go to China because they'll just copy your idea and put it everywhere. And so in reality, I just thought this is the way you do it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's, you find a factory here and, you know, and then I realized after having a factory here, it's like, oh, maybe this is not the way to do it. But then I was like, you know what? We get to pay real wages and we get to, uh, you know, deal with re real people and things like that. It's like, well, maybe this is the way we can do it. So like, how can we figure out how to keep the factory here and keep the mill running in the U.S. but still be a profitable company and be able to stay in business? And it's worked out. You know, the supply chain, like I said, is one of the biggest strengths of our business, our ability to manufacture in the states and weather the storm if there was a problem hmm. you know it's 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 been a key factor in our growth you ever think about it time to time to go overseas mm -hmm. no i mean i i have i looked at it once or twice um as a decision to go there no but just to see what it would cost for us to make it and you know could i make it for cheaper would it be harder to be as green as we are? Absolutely. Oh, well, yeah, because they you have know? to ship across the freaking Pacific Ocean. Yeah, but but like I said before. Turns I, out it's kind of, kind of, kind of yeah, big. I'm not, yeah, I'm not addicted to the, again, I'm not addicted to the sales of the company. Oh, that's you know, good. It's, I get a real kick out of, still to this day, of just seeing any random person wearing a black strap. I feel really great about that. And just, I get, the biggest enjoyment for me is hiring people. Every time we get to hire people, it shows me that the company's growing and it, I feel really awesome. Yeah. Well, then how do you go about firing them? Because that. We, have, we haven't let anybody go yet. What? With, in terms of. Ever fired anyone? We. Me personally, no. I've not actually, to be honest with you. No, I never how fired anybody. How did you get away from having to do this awful, awful thing? Because I've had to do it like three times and it eats me alive. It's terrible, right? It's. I mean, have I seen people leave in other departments that I didn't have to be a part of? Yes, nowadays. But most of the time when I lost people- You still people, have to make that decision though, right? Not in those particular cases now. Um, early on, I didn't really have to make the decision, right? Early on, like the way we built our culture is everybody- So you had, you had resignations? We've had resignations, yes. Okay. Everybody kind of has learned to own their own position, right? Mm -hmm. And over the years, we've had resignations. I've never had to fire anybody because they kind of already knew that they weren't doing the, doing that job well or good, or maybe it wasn't the right fit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, luckily I've never had to fire anybody, you know, and Gotta I'm not saying lucky. that's, I'm not saying that's ever going to not happen, no, probably but, will. but you know, I'm very passionate about my team right now. We have an amazing team that I'm really stoked on and, mm -hmm. and they all just are passionate about the job that they do. And they all know, right? Like I can't keep everybody forever. I know that. Right. Hopefully oh, I can try to, I can try to. It's incredibly a, it's a, that's a big thought that I let go a while ago. The idea of like, oh, I can, I can keep them all forever. It's very controlling. It's very egotistical. It's right. very arrogant. It's yeah. one that I had that like poisoned me and I'd be so upset when people would leave. Right. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, like 
seriously, like, like, especially in our generation, millennials, we haven't really figured out what, where we want to go or, right. or how work. long you want to be somewhere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not the same thing where you work there for 40 years and you get a golden watch and then, you know, right. and that's it. It's and going, right yeah. off the sunset, it's different. And I'm now completely okay with that. And going back to the nice guy thing of you and helping that girl with the elk, right. like that has actually ended up helping us a lot too, right. because I will literally... Every single time somebody's just like, you know, I got this opportunity or I want to go. Most of the time it's with family, like my, my somebody's sick in California or right. Portland or something. Like that Sometimes they want to go to Australia and they just want to travel and they never have. Yeah. And who am I to be like, no. No, right. What? I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, we've had people resign because they were doing bigger and better things. And mm-hmm. it's actually a compliment, right? It's like they, they got this bigger and better job because the training that they got at Blackstrap, right? It's like, I feel really good, right? right? Blackstrap like, University. Yeah, 100%, BSU. right? BSU. You got to work, yeah, you got, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. You got to work for a small business, yeah. which is literally, you were doing a million things, wearing a thousand different hats, and now you got to take that knowledge to another business, and they're going to be lucky to have you kind of thing, right? Sometimes mm-hmm. not so lucky, depending on the person. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> most of the time, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, what I love, all, most of our team members to stay with us as long as they can, yes. All I can do as a leader in our company is just know that I'm doing the best that I can and provide the best that I can and hope that people are happy with that, right? That's that's the best we can do. Um, yeah, so to take that further, like what, since I, I, I'm allowing the sentiment that you are on this, like, wow, you're like, you're, you're growing up, like this is great yeah. sort of a thing. And um, I'm now where it used to be like, don't talk to me. <laughs> don't, I don't want to clap for them when it's their last day. Right. Why are we, why are right. we celebrating that? And now I'm just, and now it's like, okay, how can I help you further on? Yep. Um, you're going to Australia. You, uh, if when you need a job, whatever, here's my cell phone. Remember, okay. hit plus one. You could do that on WhatsApp. Here's a WhatsApp. Like all those sort of things. Yep. Unless they did something um, right. really awful, <laughs> right. which it hasn't happened yet. Right. Um, that's always the right. conversation. Yeah. I, w- I mean, I really want to be on somebody's call, you know, for a reference. Right? right. It's like you know, don't you know, whether you're with me for a year or five years, right? Don't waste that time. You know, make sure that when you leave Blackstrap, you're going to take us on as a reference. Which another mm-hmm. other thing when it comes to these people, because basically uh, everybody at Blackstrap, everybody at Mazama, they're all uh, either current or future or past ambassadors right. of us. Yes. Of our companies. Yes. And to treat any of them unfairly, well, you are just passing that along exactly and one thing where i see a lot of businesses including ours what we used to do and make sure we don't do it anymore but it's overlooked a lot is when somebody comes in and applies and interviews and you just don't respond at all like they weren't the one that's actually a norm oh it is and we have a policy where everybody that applies gets an email as they should. 100%. You had all this time don't and Don't cool guy people, right? Yeah, don't cool guy people. Exactly. But And so then there you go with like the cool guy thing. And so you do that to somebody and then they end up getting a job at the Bachelor. The Bachelor example again. And then, and then they're like, yep. yeah, you know yeah, what? I remember that. Yeah. yeah. I didn't like how you didn't, I came in and interviewed and you just um, cool guyed me. Right. We, we actually know. I mean, culture and how you treat your employees and all that stuff is a thing. You know what I mean? I, oh, we, for sure. hundred percent. We've, we've noticed, at least I've noticed, you know, we've brought in a few new plays recently, you know, that came from another culture that was definitely a more negative vibe. You know what I mean? Because them coming in, they, and you, so to, what'd you to do? touch to what you're saying, right? They brought it with them. Just what'd you like do? We, was that one of the ones that you we, we, made we, resign? We, no, we sucked them into our culture until oh, you they, changed and, them. we changed them. We showed them that wow. Black Trap's a safe place and a place where you can feel comfortable and basically showed them what like a good culture could be. And I'm mm-hmm. not saying we're perfect, you know, there's always something going on, Sure, but we all try. And I think that was the key. you know, three months later with these people, it's like literally night and day different. What are the main things you're seeing changing uh, in those examples? You know, the, the big one would be accountability was a big one, right? Is where they weren't accountable. They weren't accountable at all. Right. Mm-hmm. It was who can, who's I the get first my finger, check and then we're good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> who's the first finger can I point or not a team mm-hmm. player? You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And accountability was a big one where, once we kind of got them into our culture, it was, oh, a mistake happened. How can I help fix it? Versus mm-hmm. that person did it or that person did it, right? And the, you know, another big one was worrying about everybody else, not just yourself, right? And that goes for everything, you know, like it's it makes me feel great when yeah. I walk into my office and people are having a team meeting and it has nothing to do about work. It's just how was your guys' weekend? What did you do? How do you know, like 
you know, and it's, it, you might not like everybody you work with and you might not be friends outside of work, but mm -hmm. at work we can all hang together. Right. And that was, you know, that's a dynamic that we really enjoy. I mean, we, we, have, a, we other, have a great vibe. That's the other area on the PNL where you're going to have a hard time seeing like, um, uh, meetings where it's not even really dealing with like the company. Right. And so here you are paying salaries and hourly, whatever all these right. people are compensated by standing on your time, Abe, right. Right. and not talking about growing your product, right. which by the way, it's theirs. Yeah, it's yeah right. It really, it really came down to, but, but really in reality, it was like, I, I have to come here too. Yeah. And I don't want to come to this <laughs> negative place. Yeah. Like you guys need like, you know, and it's funny because, you know, now they joke because I'm that guy, right? Mm -hmm. I'll walk up at the stairs and I'll walk into every office. I'm like, hey, how's it going this morning? You know, like, I'm, you know, I'm for, like, I'm going to come in, yeah. right? And if they don't say hi to me when I walk up the stairs, I'll walk back over and be like, good morning, you know, because I'm just, I'm trying, you know, it's like, we're coming to work, you know, you guys spend eight hours a day at least mm -hmm. here every day. Like, let's make it awesome, right? Let's enjoy what we're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's the key. That's so, so what, it's hard to see it on the PL because there's not like a line item hmm. that says, this is my ROI from doing that meeting. But yeah. I can tell from us doing um, our meetings uh, every morning. Right happier i mean they're doing egg races it might and not, building it balloon might not, towers yeah it might not improve the roi at all but you know what your self roi like the way you feel mm -hmm. is just and you enjoy coming to work and it's awesome i think it would just from the the morale that's increased like all of a sudden you have a happy morale and people are like going to their desks like smiling and connecting right. and knowing people and not only that but when you when you when you're able to communicate with people outside of just work uh, and talk about like uh, Mitch did a greatest fear um, part where like he everybody pulled on a web and it was like during Halloween and you said like what you were afraid of and when you're starting to able to understand that one thing whoever uh, runs a meeting a different person runs it every morning yeah. and one of the things they say is something about me you didn't know and so you start to end up really learning these people you're working with which yep. allows you to communicate with them better yep. figure out if they're introvert extrovert how should I approach this person um that's funny that you did that we did an enneagram test to oh. try to, to try to figure that out did it work 100 percent? no but we tried to figure out a way like how do what people, are you how do i'm a, what am i was my what, a two gonna three get, i was gonna guess a three yeah, yeah. and so uh, we were trying to figure out how do people communicate and react to, mm -hmm. and, you know and did it help a lot of our team members it did right he's like oh that's why that person reacts that way all the time you know <laughs> and so uh it helped a little bit and we're constantly trying to learn right we're trying yeah. to figure out ways and like I said, the coolest feeling is walking, you know, me not being there for a day and they're having their own meetings by themselves. It's super awesome. So what's been, what do you think is one of your main um, business hacks you think you've learned over the years? Whew, business hack. Yeah. <sighs> could be on culture, could be on like um, uh, ways of getting uh, suppliers, um, sales. Um, it's like, you know, when you do this, this pops out. Right. I'm trying to, I, I don't know. There's so many and there's so, there's a lot of little ones, nothing crazy and big. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to be honest with you is, I, I wouldn't call it a hack, but you know the, the where I told you people come in and you're just nice to people? Yeah. That seems to work pretty well. It works well. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, surprisingly yeah. in an industry of like ski, snow and outdoor, right? There's still a lot of stress, especially uh -huh. for the people that are selling and buying products. Mm -hmm. And People, it's funny, and I, I, might, I might be known in this town for this, but people get really weirded out because when they call, they say like, hello, thank you for calling so-and-so, right? Or whatever it is. And I always go, hey, so-and-so. I use their name and mm -hmm. I go, how are you doing today? And they're just like, because you can see yeah, they're just super caught yeah. off guard. You know, like, why, why mm -hmm. are you asking me that? And, you know, I usually have a 10, you know, I tell people have a 10 to 30 second conversation about like, how are you and blah, 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 and then lead into whatever you're calling about. Sure. And that hack is actually proven to be very strong in our business on both a selling spectrum, right? People tend to buy more from us just because we're nice. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's 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 worked. It's worked everywhere. It's worked with our business relationships and our vendors. And because, you know, sometimes a vendor will call and they're in the worst mood and all of a sudden you made their day better because you had a 30 second conversation about how their day is going. Oh, absolutely. Uh, also, when you just smile on the phone, they can feel that. Yeah. You know, what? Uh, one of my employees the other day came up to me and uh, it actually made me feel good. Right. And so they said, you know, it's the craziest thing, Abe. And I go, what what, what is it? And they said, I don't understand how you can be on the phone in a yelling match with somebody for whatever reason. And then I walk in and you're the nicest person. And I'm like, and I look at them and I say, well, you weren't mean to me, right? <laughs> like, I'm not mad at you. I well, can, carp I can carp To carp your employee's credit, 
that is an impressive thing. Yeah. It is, dude. The having your mind go with you. That's why like I when people say, um, oh, you're a different person when you go home than when you're at work. Bullshit. Right. You carry well, a lot of people do. You have figured it out. So I'd like to subscribe to your magazine and how right. you're doing that. Cause I'll have a, a gnarly conversation that I'll have to pull my self out of but at least i'm aware of it. i used to be in a situation yeah. where i would just be well i'm angry all day and it's, i'm justified yeah you know what helped me in that situation is what? i actually tell people i'm not angry i'm just passionate about what i was talking about mm. and i've translated that i was angry yeah well, <laughs> I'm, I'm working I can, on i don't yeah right, right, working on getting rid of the anger portion. Yeah, yeah. yeah i just you know i'm pretty passionate about everything i do you yeah. know that can go from you know cooking my son breakfast breakfast mm-hmm. all the way to selling black strap right and so I've learned to like not get angry because, you know, I used to in the beginning a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. but, you know, now I'm just, you know, if people. What's the he- point? Yeah. If people. Yeah, exactly. I'm just wasting my breath. Right. It's just. Yeah. Can I be passionate about what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Yeah. I've never found in all the times that I've gotten angry that uh, that fixed anything. I was yeah, like, it really oh, there's this one time we had a problem and I got really upset and it all went away. Right. It's never. never. It actually yeah. is the opposite. <laughs> Uh, actually, an example today, uh, one thing, so I've been working, on, I used to be really bad and justified and all that stuff. Now, two and a half years later, I can, uh, I sense it and I'm aware of it. Sometimes it still gets past me. Most time it wasn't. Actually, one of it that happened today was, uh, I because I'm practicing self-observation is a new thing I've been doing from this book called Awareness by Anthony DeMello. It's, cool. it's amazing. It's basically where you're like, look at what Bud's doing. Why is Bud doing that? And it sounds like you're crazy, but it actually helps you realize how silly it is that you're upset about traffic. Look at Bud being upset in traffic. <laughs> huh. That's funny when you look at it from that point. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And so uh, Mitch and uh, Cassie actually came up to me today and they brought over a um, proposal for us to go and give to a, a, a client tomorrow. And it's a, it's a bigger client. And I went over a bunch of stuff with them, and there was a lot of things in it that were missing from the meeting. And I'm I wasn't in the best mood today because my gout went off, and it was just I, so much pain. But it started to calm down. But anyway, as we were going through it, I was just getting I was just sensing myself getting. I was like, look at Bud getting upset about this. How can Bud? How could Bud get pulled out? You gotta do just something <laughs> ridiculous. And so what That's was funny. playing on my computer was The Lion King, um, the soundtrack, <laughs> That's funny. That's Circle funny. of Life. And it was like really quiet. And I was just like, do you remember? And so I just started cranking it in the middle of our meeting. Because I was just kidding. I was just like, no, we gotta change the way this funk I'm feeling. So I just cranked a sack of life. <laughs> just, so and Cassidy's just like, you listen to the Lion King? Like, yeah, I am. Isn't this awesome? <laughs> Mitch is like, oh my God, you're making it go louder. I am making it go louder. We're all laughing and turned it down and then it went much smoother because why get upset it doesn't make them work harder it doesn't make them do a better job that's but, funny that you did that you know i haven't read that book but i've done i've done things like that throughout the time at blackstrap to kind of change my mindset you know mm-hmm. what i mean like when i am getting upset about a certain thing right it's it's you know i would look at myself like why am i just why are you getting upset about this you're gonna be upset about this for two hours yeah. and waste two more hours of your time you know just being upset about yeah, it yeah let's just and then you might not even go to sleep right make it a learning experience mm-hmm. right or like you know and that's been a big thing you know it's don't take your don't take that negativity back home and then don't bring it back to work and you know what i mean but mm-hmm. we do have a policy too it, you know it's like you know if you're having a bad day you know like talk to somebody you know what i mean tell you don't have to right it's like but you know it's like don't be mean to people for no reason, you know what I mean? Tell us how you're feeling. It's all right, good. right. Yeah. So what is, um, uh, when when you come to like, we're right now talking a bit about self-improvement. Yep. What What is um, a, a book that you've liked when it comes to helping you improve the most over the years? Yeah, it was funny. You know, I was telling you, I sat with my wife last week and, and I've read a few. And the one that seems to stick, the one that I always turn back to and read is, you know, Leaders Eat Last. Yeah. You know, Simon Sinek. It's, went, yeah. It's... The one behind your head. Yeah, literally. I saw it when I walked in, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, that book is, I would say that book more than any other changed me, not only as a person, but changed me as a CNO, CEO at our company, right? It mm-hmm. gave me the ability to look as pe- at people as people, mm-hmm. appreciate them for the value that they are and that they're human, mm-hmm. you know, and they're not just a, a, a line item on your on your P&L, right? They're not there to just make yeah. your company money. They're, you know, they're there and you know, and in reality, you know, I read something crazy, you know, that the amount of hours that an employee gives it at a job, it's, you know, half their life or something crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, I started to think it's like, okay, how that book has kind of influenced me in, you know, making us more passionate, not just about the brand, but about each other. And because of that, because we care about each other and we care about the team and we care about, you know, the company is 
thrived because of that, right? Mm -hmm. It's everybody works harder and everybody cares more and it's, it's been awesome. Uh, I, I, I'm right there with you. It's been a book buying it for a while for a reason. I need to swap out to other books that have been, um, uh, helpful to me. Uh, but, uh, it's been there for, um, I th some of my favorite lessons in it is just being aware of, uh, serotonin, oxytocin, yep. dopamine, and, um, what's the other one I'm thinking of that I'm forgetting about, but dopamine, um, alone is just like understanding that that's caused like when we get a notification, yep. Facebook, Instagram, whatever, yep. that's a little shot of dopamine, yep. uh, drinking alcohol, dopamine, all these things. And so starting to understand that and then starting to understand the the best chemical, like oxytocin, the feel good one is yep. that selfless one we're talking totally. about with the elk, yep. the girl with the elk and everything. And when you start looking at that way and taking care of other people without expecting anything in return, like how. 100%. We just, I read the book again. I read a chapter in the book again uh, three or four weeks ago mm -hmm. and you know, which made me then initiate another policy at our office is I was trying to figure out, like, I went to every one of my, my main staff and I said, well, what are you passionate about? Like, what, what is your favorite thing to do here about? Like, what's your favorite thing to do? Correct. Mm -hmm. Cause not everybody loves to do everything that they do. Right. And they all gave me their answers. And I said, you know what? I would love for you to work on that thing at least once a day, every day. Cause you love doing that thing. No That's matter pretty what. cool. Yeah. What and if that thing is just totally not. doesn't matter. It makes yeah. them feel good. And what I, you know. What I noticed came from even in the last three weeks is that people did all the other jobs more efficient, faster, and better so that they had time to work on their favorite thing. And That's then their cool. favorite things are now becoming really important things at our company. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, one of our guys. Well, weird, right? Yeah, like it's crazy, yeah, right? It's, I, I, never would, I didn't do it for that reason. I yeah. did it so that people, when they came to work, they always had something every day to go home and say, I had a good day at work today because I mm -hmm. got to do this. That was the main reason, right? It's I didn't I don't want people to come to work and then go home and was like, oh, that was a boring day, or I hate my job, or I didn't get hired for this, you know, because those are things you hear. Mm -hmm. And so I figured out, like, hey, you know what? If I can get everybody to do at least one thing they love doing at work every day, they're gonna enjoy it. You know, and, and what I think were some cool. of the examples of that? Uh one of our so one of our graphic guys, his name's Nick, awesome guy. Mm -hmm. He loves making posters for all of our events. Just loves making posters, mm -hmm. right? Like, and you know, so where he takes old movie themes and turns them into new ones. And so now we just have a thing where it's like, you know, every day he gets to work on not, graphics that don't have to do with the company, graphics that he wants to do that maybe we could use for the company. Maybe he does it for a friend, he does mm -hmm. it for somebody else. So at least an hour a day where he can just do what he wants to do graphically so he can feel passionate about the graphic design that he does. You know what I mean? And that, that's been great. Or, you know, we have. How has that been? Gosh, I'm trying to. I, I see what you're saying, but I'm gonna push back with the all the business owners yeah. over here. It's like, how is that great for him making graphics that you're paying for that that doesn't well, have Blackstraps logo on it? So let's Abe. Let, let's let's backtrack. Come on, this, right? man. Yeah, so three, th three. <laughs> so it's been going on about three weeks now, right? Okay. I would say it, it's like uh, what's the best way to put this? You know, like you go on a binger, right? So the first three or four days, okay, it was like had nothing to do with our company, uh -huh. right? Like it was left field stuff had nothing to do, right? And then, but after three or four days, the, he got over it, right? He's like, oh, well. And then he started taking that free time and started doing stuff that had to do with the company or ways that he could progress the company graphically or ideas he had that he hasn't gotten to present because we're not there yet. That's interesting. You know, and so, and you know, I thought it was a fluke with him, but I started to notice it with other employees too. They all kind of go in this like withdrawal binging thing where they get to like let go of their work for, an hour, I'm gonna just do whatever I want because he said I could do that, you know, kind of thing. And oh my god! And then what happened is a week later, uh -huh. they were they had to do things that had to do. They got it all out of their system, you know what I mean? And it worked out pretty good, you know. Just I, okay. This, this, I I just got why this makes sense, um, and why every company should do this. So there's a school. Um, we'll have to put in the show notes uh, the name of this book that I'm blanking on, but basically. Um, a study done in England where I, or it was school was run for a while. I think it's still there, but basically kids would go there and um, it was one of the biggest successes because they would have no rules and they can learn whatever they wanted. And so kids would come there that are like, that were just destroyed, like just big issues that just want to run away and rebel and everything. And so what they do is just like, go ahead run off go off into town rebel live on the streets do your thing do whatever and then when they would come back they're like okay yeah that, that was fun but 
right. I, I, I want to come back. And they're like, okay, great. What do you want to learn? And they'd be like, I want to learn math. And then they would just start really going in on uh, geometry or whatever it is. Maybe they want to learn right. uh, science or whatever. But it was their choice. And because of that, um, what was spit out was just unreal. Crazy. Unreal, yeah. yeah. From going on a mold of like, this is what you have to do and everything right. like that. So when you said that, at first I was like, come on. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait, no, it makes complete sense. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, I don't think the methodology works for everybody, right? But, you know, I definitely remember in my upbringing, you know, my parents were very open family, right? They always said like, if you were going to do anything, just tell us and we'll come pick you up and don't worry. And so I never felt a need mm -hmm. to like go against the establishment or whatever. You know what I mean? And yeah, I, nor did I, right. but a lot of kids do. Right. And I think having that policy at work where it's like, you know, you get a little bit of time where you can kind of do whatever you want to do. You know, they kind of get it out of their system because it's been so bottled up for so many years where it's like, this is the way I was trained. Like I, I'm at work, I work, period to where I'm at work, I can do some other things. And eventually they just come right back, right? It's, I'm gonna do things for work that are maybe out of the box a little bit. It's worked out pretty well. So when you say, I want you to do something that you're passionate and you know, what that, are you saying just whatever? Well, I mean, it's not like, it's within their realm. I'm like, like don't go out and go skateboarding for an hour and mm -hmm. come back in and get on your computer, right? It's okay. like, you know, I, everybody was different. They got to tell me what they loved. It had to do with their work, right? Like what's one thing you like to do at, like that has to do with work, right? So like our graphic guys, like I like to build graphics, right? So it's like, okay, build whatever graphics you want for an hour, right? It's okay. You love doing graphics. We're like our, one of our social media guys. somebody making like a sweater? I mean, yeah. that, nobody answered that, but if that was a thing, it's okay. Go knit a sweater for an hour if it makes you feel better, right? Maybe you can knit some new design for Blackstrap that we might use in the future. I mean, I have okay. no idea. I mean, most of the people that are in our business are doing – the things that they like to do have to do with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but like uh, our social media guy, right, like surprisingly likes being on social media, right? But he <laughs> he didn't want to – he you know, and he didn't want to – uh, build new campaigns for Blackstrap. He was like, "Oh, like I want to do my own thing on social media and build figure, his own brand, brand yeah, own. and build his own company." Is like so he can do contract work on the side. I was like, "Cool, if that's what you want to do. Go ahead and do that." You know what I mean? And I do know what you mean. Yeah, and he, you know, his campaigns now for Blackstrap have been ten times better than they ever were. You really? know, and yeah, it's you know maybe it's because he got to inject some of his own passion in there. Like I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the the answer. I don't know what made it be that way, but it's, I definitely want people at our office to do things that they love to do, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially because not everybody gets to do, you know, no job you get to do 100% of the things you love to do. Mm. No, but that's a really awesome, radical way of looking at something. And I, at first was just like, it doesn't make any sense, but now it makes complete sense. And I think that's awesome. That's also in like the, what I'm referencing is the book that references it is mm -hmm. also an awareness by Anthony DeMello. It's, it, it's honestly one of those books that is just like a, like a bit of a game changer with the self observation and like how to, and and that school and stuff like that. But that's what you have on your hands right there. That's what you that's what you're practicing, and that's and it makes complete sense to me why you're seeing the best social media ads come out and you're seeing really cool new graphics coming. Maybe somebody should. Hopefully, somebody does like knitting different things, and then you yeah. can all of a sudden be like, "Hey, looks like we're making sweaters." Right? Yeah, so that was a pretty cool yeah. one. <laughs> you know, we would, somebody pumped out a fanny pack the other day, and it's like, "Cool, now we all now you should make us all some fanny packs." You know what yeah. I mean? It's you know, it's you know, we I want work to be fun but productive. Right. You know, so it's good. Well, anything else, Abe? No, I just it's been a real pleasure. I mean, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's been it's been great. I love um, rapping back and forth with you. Um, you're doing, you're growing an awesome business, and you're doing it the right way. So thanks for coming on and telling us how you do it. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it, man. That. Yep. Thanks, man. Yeah.